Our next speaker, as you can see there, is Dr. Mary Murphy from the Department of Sociology at NUI Maynooth. She's going to have a look at the law. She'll tell you more about it than I will and uh, how we protect the rights we have. Mary. Um, I'm not going to have a look at the law. <laughs> Don't know nothing about the law. Um, yeah, no, I'm not. So I hope I, I hope I haven't misread my brief. But I, what, what I want to look at is the relationship between rights and power. Um, and to suggest that unless we really engage with the reality of power inequality, that human rights approaches will, will be relatively limited in, in what they can uh, hope to achieve. So, so I come with a slight sense of provocation, I think, um, in terms of bringing into the debate maybe a, a slightly critical stance on human rights, not because I don't believe that they are necessary or are a very important part of the armory, but because I think we need to contextualise how they are operationalised um, and that on their own they are never ever enough. And I'm not suggesting anybody thinks that they are, but I think it, 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 in the broad debate about rights, sometimes they can be led to see as a panacea um, and, and for other things. So this presentation, to be clear, is totally supportive of a rights-based approach and particularly the current debate about the strengthening of economic and social rights in the Irish constitution. Um, but I just wanted to critically explore some things therein. And I'm just drawing on Kathleen Lynch's work um, that, that while rights discourses are absolutely essential, um, their potential for addressing inequality may be more limited than, than first appears. So um, I'm, I'm doing this to be provocative and devil's advocate. OK, so I'm lo looking at this audience, I'm like, Mary, is this wise? But anyway, <laughs> let's go there. Um, so challenges and limitations of rights. And again, I'm, I'm drawn on Kathleen Lynch because this is an area that I, I, I more uh, look at in, in the practice of, of the delivery of the social welfare system um, th than as a theoretical level. So I'm drawn on Kathleen's theoretical work. And she just acknowledges that when we talk about rights, we often understand them as the relationship of citizenship, the relationship between the state and society, um, and, and the, the acknowledgement of economic and social rights being an important statement from the state as a, as a marker of citizenship and what citizens can expect. But to some degree, when we bring in a lot of marketization of what are traditionally considered public services around like education, health, housing, and even welfare itself, then that's that certainly muddies the water in terms of what's achievable through rights-based approaches and, and what it means when rights are stated as economic and social rights, because we don't have a direct relationship between the provision and the receiver. There's something else mediating, and that something else is a very dodgy market. So it, it, it complicates the whole agenda. And, and that's certainly the case in Ireland, that we've seen more and more of what we would consider maybe the rights that were traditionally associated with public services, no matter how unjustifiable they were, that they're beginning to be marketised. The other, the other is the ideology of charity um, and, and a particular Irish take on that. And I think it would be really interesting in Sarah's work there just to compare the value systems between the two countries and to see the language and how different it might be. I'm often struck that when we look at, at uh, Irish, Northern Ireland and UK values, that the Northern Ireland and Southern Irish values are much more symbiotic and paralleled than the UK value system. So it would be interesting to do that. But certainly we've got the language of the deserve and undeserving poor very rooted in, in Irish welfare discourse and, and that gets in the way of rights and, and in, in the way of promoting rights. Now I do think in relation to the problem of marketization and the problem of an ideology of charity that the, it has implications for rights but rights also have a potential to address those problems so they you know, a, a chicken and an egg there, rights give us some language to counter an ideology of charity and deserving and undeserving poor. And I think even last night on the telly, <coughs> we hear, I mean, <coughs> a lot going on the telly last night, obviously, most of it distressing, but the, the disability campaigners were really, really clear that they didn't want charity, that they wanted rights, and they were very much using the discourse of rights to try and reframe a debate about austerity. And that, that in itself is interesting in terms of the language that we're using. Some of the other challenges or limitations around rights that Kathleen Lynch points out are the, the, the tendency to identify human rights as individual rights um, and, and liberal uh, rights project. Um, that, that she argues pits us in battles against each other for realising those rights, um, rather than maybe trying to find more political solutions to, to find w common agreement on, on bottom lines. 
And certainly the proliferation of many individualised rights-based demands can impoverish the, the wider macro political argument. And again, just by way of example, I suppose we see that very much in the Irish responses to austerity, which have by and large been very, very sectoralised around individual groups protecting their perceived rights, be it older people, people with disabilities, lone parents. We have, we've approached austerity in a very, very individualised way. By individualised, I mean small sectors of, of, of groups coming together. And that, to some degree, has impoverished more macro political argument about austerity and about the political economy of what's going on. Um, I know Connor earlier addressed the issue of, of comparing Ireland and South Africa. And I just wanted to show, I'm just back from a, a partial sabbatical there, where I was working um, in the context of, I wasn't working with, but I, I had an opportunity to talk with some of the shack dwellers movements and some of the unemployed workers movements there. And there is a big debate there about the degree to which that, obviously, that the stronger fundamental rights approach in the Constitution gives a serious tool to those impoverished groups to, to pursue rights-based approaches and legal approaches to realising rights. But there was a real tension in South Africa between social movements who were trying to organise politically the groups um, around mobilisation and more traditional campaigning kind of work. And then the what some considered to be the distraction of more again, siloed or sectoral approaches to trying to realise their outcomes to rights approaches. And certainly there, there was very agitated argument on the ground about the balance between which you, you, you pursue rights-based approaches to the courts or you try and mobilise politically a, a, around a different thing. So I just wanted to throw that in as a, it, it does give um, some tensions in, in, in how to move forward. Vulnerability is the other area that Kathleen draws attention to and I suppose it's the area that I want to spend most time on today um, because she makes the very I mean, common sense argument to some degree that if the vulnerable have a limited capacity for voice and for collective organisation and um, the assumption that you do have to be organised at some level in order to be able to individually or collectively claim your rights so that rights are best provided for by those who have the most capacity to claim them, to agitate for them, to advocate for them and if there are power imbalances then the most vulnerable will be at the bottom of the line in terms of being able to realise their rights. Um, and I suppose my own example from there would be the supplementary welfare allowance, um, whereby the, the, the most vulnerable of the population are reliant on the supplementary welfare allowance. And it tends to be, you, you can actually see it in action, their incapacity to realise their rights in that area, to organise around them. It, we, very lit, we very rarely hear about the battles around supplementary welfare allowance because they're never or they're rarely realised into a, a campaign um, because they're, they're very politically powerless in terms of the, the users of them, a very transient group moving in and out of them. Um, the, the area that I'm working in most at the moment is activation, and I think it just it, it brings up some really interesting examples around that idea of the most vulnerable being vulnerable to losing rights um, and to, to be not being able to vindicate rights. Um, if we look at the idea now, Ireland is bringing in a, a sort of a sanctions-based uh, work a welfare to work program where people will be sanctioned if they don't take up uh, an offer of work education or training. The evidence looking at that is that most people are well able to manage that kind of state policy. They can duck a dive around it because they have the individual capacity to manoeuvre around rights and obligations in relation to the state. The people who suffer most here are the 20% of the population who may have literacy difficulties, who may be homeless, who may have domestic violence experiences, dysfunction in their families or whatever. They are the people whose rights will be m most worn on in terms of been unable to protect their rights. So there's clear evidence when we look at individual state policies of who can't vindicate rights and who can. And even when you build in legal safeguards, there's clear evidence of who can use the safeguards to protect their rights and who can't. So Guy Standing has some work looking at the implementation of activation in the UK, and particularly this new policy of calling in people with disabilities and reliant on disability benefits for medical reassessment in, in the course of examining their entitlement. Um, it was privatised out to Otis Origin in the UK and the medical exams found three quarters of people fit to work. When people were able to vindicate their rights in terms of appeals and using the mechanisms to protect their rights, 40% of the appeals were successful. Now, when people had very good advocacy and infrastructural supports to appeal their rights, 
80% of the appeals were successful. So for me, it shows that the, 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 what you need with rights is, is very, very supportive mechanisms to enable people either protect them or vindicate them. Um, and one of the big problems in Ireland, as you know, is the changing atmosphere that there is around advocacy. Um, Brian Harvey's work, I won't go into this in great detail, but he does show the withdrawal of advocacy supports in the most vulnerable of our communities and to the most vulnerable of our people. So women's groups, for example, have experienced a 40% loss in their funding lines since the crisis started. Family support groups, initiatives against drugs, local community development programme. Uh, you know, like so, so we can see a withdrawal of the infrastructure of advocacy through which people would have relied on to either promote their rights or, or, or protect their rights. Um, the advocacy initiative itself did research w which showed that not only is funding being withdrawn, but people are feeling more vulnerable about promoting uh, rights-based approaches and also protecting people's rights. So 86% of, of NGOs who were surveyed uh, believe the environment for advocacy is more challenging. And whilst not that many of them, in fact, experienced an outcome a negative outcome from engaging in advocacy, many of them felt threatened that they would, and the threat in itself seems to be enough for them to alter their patterns of advocacy or to withdraw slightly from the advocacy. So there's a lot going on there in terms of the political climate around rights and advocacy that I think are important for, for how we understand the potential of human rights. But the real thing I wanted to look at being a, um, a lecturer in politics and society is power. Um, and the reality on, of unequal power uh, as a limitation of rights-based approaches. And I suppose, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into this slide a lot, but a lot of the political theory assumes that there's some sort of in, intrinsic equality underpinning democracy. So there's an assumption that there's some basic equality of resources for people to be able to freely participate and ably partici participate as citizens. Um, so democracy basically requires some common level playing ground for people. So when you bring poverty into the picture, and poverty as extensive as we have in Ireland, where we're comparatively in the third worst of the OECD in the EU 27, and we're getting worse over the course of the crisis, poverty really interferes with democracy and with the equal dispersion of power. So you have serious failings of the capacity of people who are vulnerable to participate in the democratic system and to realise rights through the democratic system, part of which it would be the legal in, in, in infrastructure. Um, so I think if we're talking about trying to realise economic and social rights through a human rights approach, we need to do it in parallel with enabling people to become more powerful so that they have the power to vindicate those rights should they become available uh, legally. And po poverty impacts on politics in, in lots and lots of different ways. Um, two major theories would be the resource power. Basically, if you have less resources, you are less likely to participate in politics. And, and there's loads of data to support that argument. But also the argument about relative power. The more unequal a country is, the more depressed it becomes in levels of political discourse and in levels of political participation. So it's as if the income inequalities between people separate out their commonality as citizens and democracy itself is diminished and becomes less vibrant and, and less political debate. So there's something serious going on there in relation to inequality. And the inequality of participation, it shows itself out in, in, in lots of different ways. And I suppose in Ireland, we've had more of a focus on it in relation to gender inequality and participation over the last decade or so when we're beginning to see the introduction of gender quotas but it also reverberates at lots of other levels in relation to people's voting patterns for example we know that the more money you have the more likely you are to vote political party membership only two percent of the Irish population are a member of a political party which is shocking indictment of, of political participation generally but we know that that's very directly linked to economic status as well and um, the poor are much more, less likely to be a member of a political party we know election candidates that there's a huge bias towards um, the working class people not being election candidates and certainly not being elected politicians. And we know that the middle class and upper class are much more likely to participate in wider civil society initiatives like even Amnesty itself. So, you know, there, there, there are real issues about who, who's participating and who isn't. And just to, to bring these home in, 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 a, in a, a data way, this is data from um, 1992 Dáil. 
Um, and it just maps the percentage of the population according to class and the percentage of political... Uh, uh, but this could take randomly. If you look at class, the, the working class, you can see they're a fairly healthy portion of the population, but you can see they're virtually absolutely miserable proportion of our, of our parliament. If you look at inverse, if you look at higher professionals, 4% of the population, um, but 24% of our parliament. So it's very striking when you look at who has power and who hasn't, um, and who has access to power and who hasn't. If, if you look at that a different way, this was data that we did up on class in Dáil Éireann. And this is something we don't really talk about very much in Ireland at all. I was surprised when I went to get this data. I couldn't find it anywhere. I um, had to get a student to make it because I can't do charts. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in 1997, it was bad. It was only 70% of Dáil Éireann was working class. But by 2011, it was only 3%. So th this power inequality is very, very, very real and we ignore it at our peril. Uh, there's the breakdown of classes in, in, in the present all, um, based according to political parties. <laughs> um, and you can see, I mean, all the political parties are at it. You know, some are more likely, like this is Greens, the United Left Alliance, the Independent Left, more likely Sinn Féin and Labour are more likely to bring in middle to lower classes. Um, but all the parties are dominated by the upper classes. So, you know, it, it, it is a, a very, very striking feature of the Irish political system. The farmers are getting lost completely. Um, you, know, you can see that they're, they're beginning to fade out of the political representative as well. And that could be in part because they classify themselves according to the secondary occupation that they have by and large. And that will happen more and more as part-time farming becomes more common. But I suppose what I'm trying to get through is that that we really need to realise the extent of political inequality and the degree to which that political inequality impacts on people's capacity to protect and to vindicate their rights, because it goes all the way down the line. If we have this as the mirror of our parliament, then the kinds of decisions that they're making, the kind of resources that they're distributing, all have an impact on whether or not rights can be made meaningful. Um, so power has to be in the picture when we talk about rights. Um, that's the student's name, just to give him some credit. Um, and, and that's just another way of um, looking at the representation of political class and political parties as a percentage of their party across the different things. So people can have a look at that in more detail. But I just think, I just think it's, it's worth putting out there as a, as a way of thinking um, about what it means. Because to some degree then, there can be no accounting for, for poverty. And I, I'm talking about rights in the context primarily of economic and social rights, because I mean, that's the hat I tend to wear. Um, and, and I do think that, so if we're talking about rights and the distribution of, of resources, which is, is how I understand rights, then we need to make it a more political debate than it is sometimes, because we can't really expect rights to redistribute resources unless we politically redistribute those resources as well. And that means addressing inequality from the top, as well as enabling rights to, to reinforce bottom line uh, economic and social rights for people. And I do think that we need to put on the agenda then that there's a lot that we can do to address resource inequality from the top. Um, looking, for example, at the role of property rights in the Constitution and, and how we perceive that as a human right or not, I think is fundamentally important. Looking at the rights of some wealthy in, uh, individuals and institutions to fund political parties. Looking at the right to a maximum income limiting the right to a maximum income, looking at issues of media ownership. These are all rights that we give in our constitution and that could be curtailed for the common good, not for given for the common good. So it's almost the, the opposite. But also addressing power inequality from the top, because I think, you know, al al along with economic and social rights comes political and civil rights. And to some degree, that is about power and how we distribute power. And there's a lot that we can do to separate power better in this country, to distribute power better in this country. There's just three examples there, um, you know, around ju judiciary term limits for politicians or parties, uh, how we separate power between the executive, the legislature, and uh, the, the, well, the judiciary. Um, but the other is addressing power inequality from below. Um, and whilst we think generally of using rights as a way of redistributing resources or guaranteeing some level of resources, I think we can also think about rights in relation to redistributing power. Um, like if we look, for example, power rep representation, the Shannad, uh, the abolition of the Shannad as, as an example, gives us opportunity to think about, is there a different way of using the Shannad, for example, to, to redress some of the class and gender imbalances and other kind of diversity imbalances that we see? 
Is there a more meaningful way of using quotas, for example? We're going to use them for gender. M maybe they can be used in other ways to address power imbalances. Might we want to look at compulsory voting uh, as, a, as a way of engaging in widening political participation? There's also, in terms of widening political participation, and what I spoke about earlier as the, the withdrawal of funding and enablement of advocacy and, and NGOs more generally, there is the possibility of looking at strengthening associational democracy in the Constitution and looking at the right to funding for advocacy. Um, and that would be very much, to me, a way of, without putting any extra rights in the Constitution, strengthening the capacity of individuals to protect and vindicate the rights that they have would be a, a, a step in the right direction. There's the issue of consultation involving people in the designing, the planning, the implementation of policy by right. One of the good examples from activation policy at, at some European countries is recognising that if you're going to oblige people as a condition of their income support to participate in unemployment and recognising that that is a curtailment of of a right in some way, that it would be rebalanced by their right to participate in the implementation of the policy to make sure it was done in a fair and a balanced way. So participation in the process is a, is, is a right in itself. And then there's the whole issue of education and voters, uh, voter education, civic education, that I think is very important. So just to finish up, I suppose I've been very much talking about, you know, the, the the, the difficulties in realising economic and social rights from the perspective of the vulnerable, the need to have uh, infrastructure and advocacy um, and, and greater equality of outcome if we're to really talk about making those rights meaningful. Um, but I think just to, to finish and going back to that indivisible idea of universal rights is to make the link between economic and social rights and political and civil rights and that you, you need both moving forward together in, in, in a very um, necessary way because there is no real theoretical division between economic and social rights and political and civil rights. I think culturally we have begun to think of them as quite different things because it's seen as that, you know, one or negative rights they require the state almost not to do something the other are positive rights that require the state to do something but but most rights require the state to actively intervene to guarantee that that they happen um and i think economic and social rights in particular th they will never be just a function of law uh, they will always always require to be linked to political action and political advocacy and, and proposition. They, they will always need something to enable them to become real. And because of that, they have to be linked to an understanding of who has the power to, to vindicate them and make them become real. And I think probably the most important and the strongest this thing that, that economic and social rights give us is their political capacity, is their capacity to actually enable us to free, reframe debates about austerity, uh, about charity, about welfare, and to give us a new normative discourse that can be stronger than what's been available to us to date. It gives us a discourse that enables maybe more solidarity um, than we've been able to see in the discourse of welfareism and charity. And that gives the possibility of, of different kinds of alliances around anti-poverty issues and around protecting the needs of the vulnerable, um, and particularly uh, alliances across the legal community and the anti-poverty community, which which are, you know, they're not as strong as they, as they might always be sometimes. So I do think that there's a, an awful lot of potential in drawing out the usefulness of the relationship between all these things and forcing ourselves to engage critically about how to understand them in, in frameworks that might be more useful to us. So I'll leave you with that challenge. Thank you.